Good evening, and welcome to the MAG Network. Tonight, we are joined by Judy Phelps, of On Guard Self-Defense, from Southern Ohio. Judy is an NRA-certified instructor and will be discussing how to keep yourself and your family safe and doing it legally. If you have additional questions for Judy or want to see their current class offering, visit their website at www.onguardselfdefense.com. To find out about future events, both in person and virtual, visit us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash groups slash magnetwork or you may email us at mag.network at gmail.com. If you don't mind, we'll go ahead and get started and hopefully some of the other people will pop on in. Would you just introduce yourself, Judy, give us some background and stuff like that? Uh, at the end, everyone, we'll, she'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and then if y'all hang around when she's done, I want to talk about some stuff that we've got coming up and like to have some input on some stuff y'all would like to see coming into 2023. With that, Judy, thank you for being here and looking forward to this. Just a reminder, everyone, we are recording this because there's a lot of people that can't make it tonight that would like to see it. So, you know, if you don't want to be on camera, by all means, just turn your camera off. Everyone is muted right now, except for Judy and myself. If you want to ask a question, make sure you unmute. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I am always uh, uh, willing to speak with anyone about uh, ways that we can keep ourselves safe, especially in this day and age, as we've been conversing here before this call started. Um, you know, crime, of course, is up. Um, there's so many uncertainties in the world. And so getting prepared in every way that you can possibly do is sort of my forte, especially when it comes to um, physical safety. Um, I own On Guard Defense, Defense Training Center and Shooting Range. I'm located in the um, southeast part of Ohio. It's an area uh, known as the Hocking Hills. It's a touristy area. Um, we moved down here about 12 years ago from the Columbus area. And so it was one of the best uh, decisions that we ever made. So um, being out here in the country, in the forest, um, you know, it's, it's just such a blessing. And so I opened five years ago, this training center. Um, and, uh, you know, we focus on unarmed self-defense. We focus on, uh, building a defensive mindset. We focus on, of course, firearms, uh, defensive firearms training. Um, we do archery, we do all kinds of things. And, um, as of late, one of my, um, instructors just became certified on, um, something called martial blade concepts, which uh, introduces the knife to the mix. Um, there's sometimes that we simply can't uh, be armed with a firearm, but um, most of us uh, carry around a knife or, you know, a tool to use um, cutting open boxes, whatever we do. But if that's something that we can lawfully carry, um, then that's also something that could be a tool that we use in self-defense. Um, my credentials are that I am, um, an NRA pistol instructor, a rifle instructor, an NRA chief range safety officer, and a commando Krav Maga, uh, level two instructor. Um, and obviously I own, uh, the training center and shooting range. Being a female in this business is sort of a rarity, although um, that's changing, but I do focus heavily on training women. Um, uh, during the scandemic, the bulk of the new guns were sold to women, I think upwards of 43%, uh, many of which were brand new gun owners. So, um, and that's only continued. Um, so there's a lot of females out there that are getting into guns that, um, had never considered uh, being gun owners before. But again, with the increase in crime, even folks that thought that it could never happen to them or they would ever never even need um, this sort of defensive tool are now sort of uh, crossing over. Um, but let's talk about uh, keeping ourselves safe and our family safe, regardless of whether we live in the city, in the country, wherever, because crime is everywhere. And I always say that um, a defensive mindset is the greatest tool that you can have in your arsenal. It's that survival mindset. 
It's that mindset that um, you are not in denial about what's going on in the world, that you understand that bad things happen to good people and it could happen to you. Um, the victim mentality is such that folks think that, um, you know, I never go to dangerous places. I, I never go out after dark or um, I don't know any bad people and it can never happen to me. And, you know, that is a, a victim mentality and that is what gets people in trouble. So we don't want to be that person. We want to be aware that bad things happen and sort of do mental exercises to prepare and consider what ifs. If, if we do that, then heaven forbid we get into a similar situation. We've already played through at least a similar scenario and have developed even a mental plan. So um, building that defensive mindset is critical. Um, at the foundation of that is situational awareness. And a lot of folks will roll their eyes to situational awareness, but the fact of the matter is, is it's more important now than ever because um, where's, where's my, everyone has one of these, right? Um, a cell phone. And um, oftentimes when we're in public, we don't even see people's faces anymore because their faces are buried in their cell phones. And um, that is a victim waiting to happen. Um, you're not paying attention to the world around you. And that uh, can be uh, that surprise attack, which means again, you're caught off guard um, and you're uh, less likely to be able to respond. Um, and really the first few seconds, milliseconds is what really matters. So we've got to put away those distractions. The cell phone is a huge distraction. We need to put it away. Um, you know, I realize we need to use it in our day to day lives. But what I'm saying is, is if you're going to go out in public, send that text, um, you know, check your email, do whatever you're going to do when you're in the safety of your own home, when you're in the safety of maybe your own car, um, and then put that cell phone away and then go about your business. Because if I get, if I'm in my locked car in a parking lot with the intent of going into a grocery store, I want to make sure that all my distractions are put away and I can look all around me and my car to observe what's happening around me. Is there anything shady looking going on? Um, you know, because if there is, I'm still in the safety of my own car. I can, you know, start my car back up and uh, go somewhere else or park in another area maybe that is further away from whatever, whatever um, gave me some weird vibes. But we'll never be aware of those things if we've got our heads in our phones and we're distracted. So when we exit our vehicle and we're heading towards, you know, the entrance of the grocery store, we need to be looking around us and observing our environment so that if anything goes south, that we're more apt to recognize it right away and be able to avoid or escape the situation. Um, and speaking of avoid escape, those are two options and those are the two preferable options if you're ever in a bad situation. Avoid it if you can, and you do that through practicing that good situational awareness. Escaping, once you've recognized a threat or a potential threat, being able to separate yourself from it, um, get in your car, go somewhere else, leave the building, leave the situation. Um, because the last option, um, if anything bad goes down, is to defend. And defending yourself can come in a variety of different ways. But ultimately, if your life's in danger, then you're going to be talking about having to defend, defend yourself and potentially use deadly force. Again, we can use deadly force with our fists. We can use um, an object, um, a gun, a knife, um, a frying pan, right? Um, so any object can be used uh, as deadly force if necessary. Um, but when we're looking around, one of the things we need to do is, like I said, if any, anyone looks out of place, um, you know, 
the Boston Marathon bombers, I, I talk about this a lot, you know, there were throngs of hundreds of thousands of people in the um, in that area, uh, the runners in the race, spectators and, and fans and supporters, um, law enforcement and security, both uh, uniformed and plain clothes, all of these things happening. And um, it was a spring day, uh, people are all dressed in uh, t-shirt, shorts, what have you. And then you've got these two cats that we now know were the Sonarna brothers. And they they both are dressed head to toe in black, long pants, long sleeve shirts, um, dark glasses and big backpacks um, on their backs. And they're just, you know, moving throughout the crowd. And it's unbelievable to me um, that so many people are so engaged in what they're doing and so few people are looking around, scanning the crowds, looking for things that are unusual. Um, he got past the, you know, uniformed and, and like I said, playing co uh, closed cops too. But the old adage goes, um, you see something, you say something, but you can't see it or say anything to react if you're not paying attention. So I'm not saying don't enjoy what you're doing, whatever, but if we aren't looking out for us, no one else is. And there are bad actors everywhere. They're attracted particularly to big places where they can, um, you know, impart mass destruction. So if you're not familiar with the end of that story, the Sonarnev brothers in those backpacks had pressure cooker bombs and they separated, put down in place their um, bags and then left and detonated it. And then there was all that carnage. And, you know, uh, that was one of the big cases that that led our airports um, to every, it seems like five minutes to come across uh, the speaker saying, you know, no unattended baggage and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, you have to pay attention. So, you know, there's those visual cues um, in terms of, are these people dressed like the rest of us? Does anything look out of um, place? It doesn't necessarily mean they're bad guys or bad gals, but it certainly should heighten your awareness in, in watching them. And if necessary, if you really are feeling, um, you know, agitated by it, uh, you need to separate yourself, separate your family, you know? get up from that restaurant and go to another restaurant, right? Um, you know, you never know what situation you miss when you um, really hone in to that gut feeling is what we call it, right? And um, it's a blessing. It's a self-defense mechanism that we have. The unfortunate part is so many people um, suppress that gut feeling and blow it off. Um, and then bad things happen, right? So always trust your gut, right? Be looking around, looking for people that don't fit. Maybe people are uh, outward displays of anxiety or aggression. Obviously, that's a huge cue. Hey, separate yourself. Too many people want to pick up their cell phones and tape something, videotape something, and um, getting them closer to a potential ticking time bomb. So, you know, make space, get away. All right. If you're not paying attention in this world, you will be a victim sooner or later. So we like to say that um, if you're one of those people that isn't paying attention, you're in a condition white, um, complete unawareness of your surroundings, and you're not prepared to act if in fact you need to. Now, we can talk all day about bad guy, bad gal, but we also need to understand that there's bad things that can happen um, associated with acts of God, you know, weather emergencies, um, you know, look what happened in Sanibel, uh, Sanibel Island and, and Fort Myers. Uh, that was something that was devastating, right? So, you know, you have got to pay attention to what is going on around you so that you can make a plan to react so that you can avoid a situation or escape a situation. So really where you want to be is this comfort zone we call condition yellow. It is a sense of awareness um, as you move throughout the public 
Um, and, uh, but it's not a sense of paranoia. You know, you're not like freaking out all the time. In fact, it's a very natural thing. Again, if you're not distracted by that phone, um, you would be amazed at the world around you is what I tell people. So we know we're looking for, you know, bad vibes from certain, uh, the way someone's dressed, the way someone behaves, whatever. Some of the other things that are super important to be aware of before you need them well, let's think about those three options we had if something bad happens. Avoid through situational awareness. Escape is our second option. If escape is our sec second option, then you better know all of your methods and means of escaping a building. So if we go to the grocery store and it's the same grocery store we always go to, we sort of get in an auto, uh, a mechanical zone. Hey, I've been here thousands of times. Um, nothing bad's ever happened. Nothing bad will happen in my town, at my school, at my grocery store, um, when in fact it could. So instead of just being aware, like we all are, of the main points of entry and exit to your grocery store, to your church, to um, your place of business, make sure that you would take a lap that'll only take a minute or two, take a lap around that building and look at all of the places that you see where there's a door leading to the outside world. Because then when you go into that establishment, you have some sort of spatial awareness going on. And so you can be pushing your card and say, hey, I think there's a likely an exit behind the meat counter or behind the deli or whatever. These things are imperative to know in the event of an emergency. Um, it's kind of like if we uh, uh, work for an employer, um, they've got fire escape plans, right? Um, you know where you can sound the alarm. You know that if the elevators don't work, that you have to go down this hallway or corridor and get down the steps and all of these things. Um, if there's a tornado, maybe you live in a tornado prone area like I do. You have to identify places that you can hunker down that might uh, do a good job withstanding um, a potential tornado in your area. Um, those are, you know, uh, cement block uh, uh, layered sort of um, uh, office spaces or buildings or what have you. And in fact, those concrete block walls are a great thing if you're ever in caught in the crossfire of a gunfight, right? Because that is a source of cover, which is another thing that you want to be looking for. So you're now, you, you've got, you're looking at people, you know your exes before you need them. Now we're looking for things that we can use to our advantage if say bullets start flying, okay? Maybe you're at the mall and there's a mass shooting that's going on. You need to identify um, barriers, cover, and concealment. So concealment is just like when we talk about concealed carry our, our firearm. We're covering it up. We're concealing, we're hiding it. So if there's a mass shooter, yes, there are many things probably in a mall that I could hide behind to conceal myself. And so those are useful. Um, however, that is less beneficial than um, maybe barriers or cover. Barriers are something that you can put between you and a particular threat, meaning they have to do something with what's in between before they can get to you, um, meaning get their hands on you, or if they have a um, knife to get that close in close quarters combat. Now, if they have a gun and you have a car between you and, uh, or a table uh, between you and the threat, well, um, that bullet will go right through that car, right through that table, whatever. Um, cover uh, is the best. So we've got concealment, we've got barriers, cover. Cover would be, as I mentioned before, if there's a tornado or if there's gunfire, if the building you're in has a block wall um, room or rooms instead of drywall, um, 
a much better choice. In fact, a lot of people choose their sort of um, safety room in such um, a place in their home if you're afforded that. Certainly in public places and spaces like um, office buildings and schools and things of that nature, you're gonna find those um, readily available. It's knowing where they are and, and hopefully getting yourself to um, that sort of room um, and locking yourself in. Um, because if the bullets are flying, they're not going to uh, likely penetrate those concrete block walls. Similarly, um, in public, we might be at a parking garage um, and there's those big cement columns, right, that are every now and then. And some of them have those call boxes in the event of an emergency. Um, but those big concrete pillars are an excellent source of cover. Uh, most of us can at least get real uh, skinny walk, uh, uh, turning sideways, taking cover so that we can assess the situation. But if there's bullets flying, it will protect us behind that, um, behind that column. Um, I mentioned cars can be a barrier. Yes, I could be standing on one side of the car and bad guy with a gun can be standing on the other. And obviously, you know, still be able to shoot at me. Um, but on the other hand, cars are an excellent source of cover. Um, if you see on TV in the movies, a uh, shootout with cops, you'll see cops crouching down behind um, the wheel of maybe their police cruiser or another car. Um, placement matters because a lot of folks don't quite realize, well, what's stopping those incoming rounds? It's not the wheel, it's not the tire, it's actually that big engine block that's under the hood. So, you know, choose your placement wisely. Um, you will want to be obviously on the opposite side of the gunfire, hunkered down um, as low as you can go, protecting your head. And, um, you know, that big engine block should be a good source to deflect um, incoming rounds. Now, if you scooted back just a couple of inches, um, again, uh, uh, bullets can certainly uh, go through the driver's door, traverse that empty space out the passenger door. And if you're on the other side, yes, um, you can get hit. So um, those are things that you want to identify when you're in that condition yellow. You're just looking around um, and observing these things that um, you can use to your advantage. The other thing that's great is makeshift weapons, okay? Okay. Maybe you're not old enough to carry. Um, maybe you don't have a license in your state and that's required. Maybe you're going to one of those um, horrifying gun-free zones where uh, most bad things happen. Um, I try to limit myself to doing uh, to visiting places like that, but I realize some of us work in those places, um, maybe have to seek out medical, medical care, whatever. Um, go to the post office. All of those are uh, gun-free zones for sure, um, as well as other places. You have to uh, be aware of the laws in your state. So, um, but yeah, makeshift weapons are great. Um, you know, and makeshift weapons, frankly, can be this bottled water, okay? It can be my cell phone. It can be my car keys that I can gouge at someone if I need to. Um, it can be anything, any object at our disposal, um, you know, and, and maybe it's not something that's going to, you know, knock somebody out or whatever, but you always have to fight back. And those milliseconds you gain in doing so, in throwing something at someone, even someone, AR guy, he's got his AR and he's wanting to, uh, you know, reap his mass, uh, as much destruction as he can. And unfortunately, too few people act, they freeze um, because they've never thought it could happen to them. Remember that defensive mindset, right? Um, so, but even if you can't hurt or disable someone, if AR-15 guys spray in and you have access and you're in the grocery store and you have access to a canned good or whatever is in your hand, you're throwing it because that person has the same automated reaction that you and I have. And again, this is a defense mechanism that God gave us that, you know, if you throw something at me, I don't care if it's a can or a ball, I see something coming at me, I automatically raise my hands up to protect my head. Okay. AR-15 guy does the same thing. He can't control that. 
Okay. And he sure as heck isn't going to be able to, you know, shoot, you know, cans of tomato sauce out of the air. Okay. So the point being the first part of fighting back is using those makeshift weapons because when he raises his hands up to block his head, down falls that AR-15, which gives you the time to then rush in and hopefully do some damage. Um, but you don't want to just give up. And, you know, we all hear so much about fight and flight, but fight and flight is the response that maybe only 20 some percent of, um, of people, uh, how they react when they're in a, in a threatening situation. The other 70 to 80% is actually the third F, which is freeze, okay? And again, the, your reaction is, is equitable to the amount that you've trained. And yes, you can get physical training, uh, gun training, you know, all of these things, but developing the defensive mindset is a, again, the foundation. You have to consider that bad things can happen to you. And some of the mental exercises I do, you know, you don't have to go far, right? Maybe you're on social media, on your news website, whatever the case may be. There is no um, shortage of heinous crimes available. And so when I see that a jogger in New York was, uh, you know, attacked, choked out, raped, robbed, um, you know, it's an everyday occurrence. So I try to put myself mentally in the shoes of that victim, reading the details or listening to the details that are available at that point and saying, what would I do if this happened to me? How would I handle the situation? That is part of the battle. And that is part of de uh, developing that defensive mindset. So when we're in condition yellow, we have the ability to be aware of the people around us the methods if we need them to escape a situation post haste and things we can use to our advantage, you know, barriers, cover, concealment, makeshift weapons, right? And our fists, right? Um, so those are things that you should be looking at and considering as you're going about your day and whatever. Now, what do you, what happens if you run into something that looks bad? Okay. Again, you can't avoid it now. Can you escape? You should make a, 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 a quick exit if you can, because you're better if something goes down to call 911 from a safe space instead of be in the thick of it. So avoid, escape, defend. All right. If you're in a situation that goes south, when you recognize it, you're going to go from that condition yellow to what we call condition orange. You have um, noticed a specific uh, a threat that you're not sure yet if, if it's a real danger, but it's making you not feel right. That gut feeling. Again, if you can't escape, you need to at least separate yourself. If you can, you're still assessing the situation. Either it is going to dissipate. And so you will go back from orange down into yellow and you're back to your awareness mode. If it escalates, then it, you have identified positively that this is a threat. You're in condition red. Condition red means your options are, I have to defend. I have to act now. Now, let's talk um, a little bit about um, the legal use of deadly force. I will preface this with, you heard my bio before, I am not a lawyer, nor do I uh, pretend to be. But as a firearms instructor, I understand and am responsible to understand um, Ohio is where I'm from, Ohio's gun laws, and um, uh, uh, relay those uh, laws to my students when we teach our concealed carry classes and such. So the rules of using deadly force, I think of this as sort of a blanket umbrella regardless of where you live in the, in the country. Um, uh, you know, the wording may be a little bit different, but in Ohio, the rules of using deadly force um, are as follows. Rule number one, you must be in imminent uh, danger of losing your life or uh, have, experiencing great or grave bodily injury. In the state of Ohio, 
rape is included in that. Okay. So rule number one is pretty cut and dry. If you're going to use deadly force, whether with a firearm or your fists or anything in between, you're going to be in fear for your life. Right. Or in Ohio, it can be uh, uh, in fear of, uh, for the safety uh, and life uh, of someone, you know, right. Um, your family member, whatever, or as a good Samaritan, you can stick your neck out there. I wouldn't always suggest that, but the real crux of, of it is you are using deadly force because deadly force is being used against you and the danger is imminent. Rule number two, you must be an innocent party. So what does that mean? Being an innocent party means that you didn't start the uh, fight. You didn't escalate the fight. Um, and that this all came about due to, um, someone else and their actions and behaviors, right? Um, maybe you even tried to deescalate. Okay. Which is good. Um, but, uh, you must be an innocent party. You can't agitate the situation, instigate the situation, prolong the situation. Okay. Um, rule number three goes back to avoid escape, defend folks. Um, and that is no, reasonable means of escape was available to you. Okay. So in other words, um, you decided to use deadly force when you could have just left. Right. Um, so that's what that means. Now, a lot of people say, wait a minute, I have stand your ground, stand your ground. I understand Ohio is also a stand your ground, um, state. However, always, 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 we want to avoid having to use that third option, which is defend. So if we can avoid it, let's do it. If we can escape it, absolutely. Because if we end up having to defend ourselves, um, you know, not only we could, we could get hurt, we could get killed, um, so many other things. So if there's any other option than um, using force uh, to defend yourself, always exercise that lesser option. So we've got uh, rule number three is no reasonable escape was available to you. Rule number four is the force that you use must be reasonable for the situation at hand. We've all heard um, the term excessive force, right? So, um, you know, I'll use an example. Um, you're uh, somewhere and get into a verbal uh, argument with someone over politics or whatever it may be and someone reaches out and slaps your face and you all of a sudden decide you're going to pull your gun. It's like, no, that's excessive force, right? Um, so those four rules, again, um, for using deadly force, you must be in imminent danger, fear of uh, losing your life or experiencing great grave uh, bodily injury. Rule number two, you must be an innocent party. Rule number three, there were no reasonable um, and safe means for you to escape the situation. And rule number four, the force that you use must be reasonable for that situation. So that said, um, you know, you get into a condition red where all of those rules apply. Obviously, you need to fight, fight, fight. Um, and the only way that you're going to fight, fight, fight is being mentally prepared. Again, it's so important that you realize that even if you live in a small town or live in a safe place or what have you, um, it can happen to you. Um, and so if you, heaven forbid, get into that defensive mode, then you have to have tools available to you. Um, the defensive mindset is what we've talked about today. Um, unarmed self-defense is an option. Uh, we teach Krav Maga at On Guard Defense. That is uh, was developed by the Israeli Defense Forces. So, um, but there's all kinds of self-defense um, uh, training out there. So just you know, go and search the internet uh, for something in your area if that's something that. Um, is available to you because, uh, you know, you, you're always taking these guns wherever you go. So, um, realizing as well that some of us may not be at the fitness level or, um, uh, uh, you know, ability level to do that. So then we need to think, well, what are some kind of defensive tools that I can, um, possess lawfully and, um, gain training on so that if, 
heaven forbid I have to deploy it, that I can do so confidently. So um, paying attention to that environment, um, making smart decisions, avoiding any distractions, especially when you're in public. Let's talk about home safety. Um, you know, that's our castle. Hopefully all of us um, button up that castle uh, by way of locking our doors and windows. Again, when I grew up, we didn't lock our doors and windows. Um, but yeah, that's something that we all have to do regardless of where we live. So that's our sort of perimeter security. Now we want to have multi layers of security and not everyone's going to have everything and not everything is really relevant. You have to figure out what's right for you. But, you know, I have a, a, a dog, right? Uh, many of us have a dog and some are big dogs and some are aggressive dogs and, um, uh, you know, security uh, dogs and some are little tiny dogs, but are an excellent um uh, uh, security layer as well, because if they yap, 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 and, um, uh, you know, when they hear something that isn't right, that's a good thing, right? Um, security systems are popular um, and certainly an option. Um, I really believe that, uh, you know, yes, the perimeter security will trip um, with the security systems, but I believe the best part of a security system is the actual yard sign that says you have a security system. Um, we've had security systems in the past, and of course we do, um, you know, at our range, but um, for our home, I had security systems in the past and, you know, the kids or, or I would even, um, you know, accidentally trip it and then, you know, false alarms, and then it becomes a pain in the rear end. And so, you end up not even using it, right? So, um, but that sign in your yard that says you have one, which you can buy for six bucks online, um, is a deterrent. Uh, when people are casing your area, casing your neighborhood, casing your home um, with the plan of, uh, it's usually a B&E, a breaking and entering, um, you know, burglary, um, they're looking as to whether your house is an attractive uh, looking place to hit or um, unattractive. And so just that sign is something that will say, huh, that's going to make my job harder. And as a criminal, criminals are very lazy um, and they're looking for quick hits. So um, use those lights in your home. Um, we're getting ready here in Ohio uh, to uh, fall back an hour this week. So it's going to be dark at like, I don't know, 4 35 o'clock. Um, so many of us are leaving our homes, um, you know, uh, when it's daylight, but you know, then we're returning when it's dark, we need to plan for that. Get timers on our lights, get dust to dawn lights, um, is a great, uh, uh tool. Um, leave the lights on if you don't have those other, other mechanisms because they don't use much electricity. And, you know, you're better to have a well-lit area and home because again, burglars and bad people do not like um, light, you know? That's why most bad things go down in low light or, or darkness, but that's not always the case. But yeah, lights are good. Lights on the outside, lights on the inside. What you're communicating with those lights is, is someone's home, all right? And they aren't looking, the vast majority of people, criminals, aren't looking um, to break into the home and be visited by one or more people, okay? They uh, want quick hit smash and grabs. So if your home looks occupied, you're again, putting it lower on that list that looks inviting to criminals. Um, another thing that we do for home security is we want to make sure that um, we harden the exterior doors. And a lot of times folks spend a lot of time and money investing in the, the physical locks. Some people have multiple locks and chains and all this stuff, and it gets very complex, but they want to harden that door so that it can't be uh, kicked in. Makes sense. However, most doors, unless they're steel um, or, or solid wood, um, most doors can be kicked in quite easily and quickly because it's not the door locks that are necessarily being compromised. It's the striker plate. Okay. And I don't know if you can see this, but 
These striker plates are held by two little tiny itty bitty screws, okay? That's what's giving way when bad guy kicks on your door. So let's make his life harder, okay? And we go to the hardware store, pick up some three and a half inch screws, pop those babies in, both of those. And now just by that uh, uh, change, you've reinforced the strength of that door and jam um, over 10 times. So why does it matter? Well, because if bad guy is lazy and he's kicking once and kicking twice and kicking three times, by that time, he's going to give up and he's going to move on. Um, this is too hard. He's creating noise, which maybe sets off the neighbor's dog or your dog or whatever. So um, those are very good things and very cheap ways to harden your um, exterior. Um, the other thing that I really like, especially ladies, if, um, if you live alone, if maybe you're, um, you work at home or are a stay-at-home mom and your spouse travels, goes out of town, is gone. Um, these little guys are made by a company called Sabre, S-A-B-R-E. And these are doorstop alarms. So cheap. They're like 10 bucks. Um, put in a, a battery and then there's an on off switch on the back. If I just put that on when I shut my bedroom door, when I go to sleep at night, or, um, uh, maybe I'm going to take a shower and no one's home. And, you know, I can't hear if someone, you know, would break in my front door. I shut and lock my bathroom door. I put this in, maybe I'm traveling. Um, so this is compact. I can take this in my luggage, um, and when I stay at a hotel, I can put this there. What does it do? I won't press the button. I just, in fact, turned it off. I want to make sure I did. Um, I didn't want to blast your ears, but it is a high pitch noise when a door is opened. And so, um, and it's also going to give a little bit of give. It not, might not necessarily keep them out, but the point is, you are getting a shrieking alarm notifying you that your door, your home, your um, hotel room has been breached and allows you those couple of seconds to be able to react and um, deal with the situation. So um, let's see, why don't I take questions? You're just that good, Judy. That's really good. <laughs> I tend to have a big mouth, so I run on and run on, and I want to um, make sure that we left some time if anyone has any questions or something I didn't address. I know well, that I've got a person that's messaged me. They're in the background, and they got stuff going on, so they can't ask questions. So I told them if they have questions, they can put it in chat or ask me and I'll ask them stuff. So, uh, sure. I love the, most people don't think about some of the basic situational awareness. You know, watching, when you're going into a restaurant, where is an alternate exit if I have to get out? Uh, like you said, most people watch these action movies on TV. Well, if I get behind my door, they can't shoot through that door. Well, wrong. You know, it, and it is, it is basic things. Those concrete pillars. Hey, I'm a big boy. But if I turn sideways, you've only got a small part of my stomach you may get, you know, minimize right. the risk. And that's what it's about, like knowing what's going on around you to minimize the potential risk. So I'm glad you touched on that. It was really good information. Yeah, it's actually imperative because, like I said, you know, um, now with the proliferation of the cell phones, I mean, even young children have have their faces in cell phones and yes. um you know, I call those folks potential uh, victims. And, you know, we really have to have our head on a swivel, so to speak, so that we're able to react um, in a timely manner. Sure. Hey, what age do you think would be a good, what's a good age to introduce a child to defense, whether it be just personal self-defense or actually taking them to a gun range, getting used to the sound, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, what, what's, what, what's your from your background, what's a good starting point for the different things like that? 
Well, um, for the little ones, uh, NRA has an Eddie Eagle program, which really uh, uses sort of a cartoon based character and characters to talk about uh, gun safety for the littles, where um, it's it's basically stop, don't touch, run away, tell a grown up because the littles, you know, we don't want them with their uh, hands on firearms um, until they get to uh, a time and place where they um, are mature enough to understand the responsibility and follow directions. So when you ask for an age, that really I leave up to the parents in terms of um, their maturity level. Now at my range, my insurer, uh, uh, only insures uh, kids with firearms 10 years old and up. So that's our particular uh, rule. But even 10 year olds, 13 year olds, 15 year olds, um, they may be uh, the age appropriate, but they, um, their behavior, their attitude is, is not conducive uh, to going there just yet. Um, Unarmed self-defense is certainly something that kids can start as young as, as five, five years old and up, um, you know, age appropriate uh, techniques. And, you know, with the littles, we're talking about, you know, uh, not accepting candy from strangers, not talking to strangers, you know, um, stranger danger, all of those sorts of things. Sure. And again, again that's a good point. You know, like, like you said earlier, you know, growing up, we didn't lock our doors. Uh, no. It wasn't unusual to be out riding our bikes all over the neighborhood. You know, uh, if anything about an, another parent, they would call my parent and say, well, he's doing something wrong. But, right. you know, and I hate to say it, but nowadays you can't really do that. You do have to teach them of stranger danger. You know, don't accept this. Don't go up to a car or a van. If they say, oh, I've lost my little puppy. Can you help me? You know, and, I, and it's bad that you have to do that, but that's a good point. You need to, to teach them from a young age the basics of that and just build on it as they grow. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, child sex trafficking is a, um, well, it's, it's the biggest problem, in my opinion, that our country and the world faces. Um, it is the industry of industries, even uh, above firearms and um you know, sex trades and whatever, drug trades, uh, it's prolific and it's horrific. Um, and so, yes, there's a balance um, of, of how we address these sorts of issues with kids, but it certainly is something that, that has to be discussed at, at their uh, age and maturity level um, because it's just, it happens too frequently and it happens everywhere. Sure, sure. Good point. Sherry, any questions from your, your, you up in your neck of the woods, ma'am? No, none here. Do you have any, Jeff? No. Uh, no, no. She did a really good job. Yeah, I agree. Thank I, you. I, I appreciate you coming. Thank how you. can, how can anyone that's interested reach out to you? How can they find you? You know, what, what you're offering, offering up there on guard and stuff like that. It, what, how can they contact you and, and see what's going on and possibly coming up and, in taking some of your classes. Yes, um, we have our website, onguarddefense.com. Uh, it's got a full course schedule, description of all of the classes. As I said, I uh, focus a lot on women um, and uh, women tend to learn uh, firearms and self-defense from uh, better from other women. Uh, you know, a lot of the guys in the gun industry are, you know, former military law enforcement and they are barking at people and, and women don't respond in the same way to that. We do um, not do that. Now, come on. <laughs> uh, all too often they do because I was once uh, uh, their student. So um, yeah. Uh, so we have lady warrior weekends, lady warrior boot camps. Those are focused on gathering ladies together and teaching them a combination of unarmed self-defense and um, uh, firearm skills, uh, particularly with the pistol and um, we also obviously have uh, kids. Uh, we have teen summer camp every year, um, first shots. We, uh, we have couples home defense weekend. So we've really got something for everyone. We do 
uh, uh, old school survival boot camp is here in my county, in Vinton County. It's every May. And so we're a big part of that. We offer different classes uh, while that's going on as well here at our range and at the fairgrounds where uh, the event is held. So yeah, you can reach out to me on my website um, and just fill out the form. I'm the gal on the other end. So I, um, I'll i try to direct you as best as I can if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, let's start paying attention. Let's start, um, if, if you're already a gun owner, dust off those guns, you know, make sure that you know how to operate them, that they're functioning well, that you've maintained them, um, that you have a pr appropriate and proper ammo on hand. Um, because during the last two and a half years, it's been a, a really uh, crazy situation with um, lack of availability and double, triple, quadruple price on ammo. So it's been yeah. crazy. It has been. I agree with you there. Closing thought, what in your mind is the the number one thing that that we should get from your takeaway tonight? You covered a lot of great stuff, but what's the what do you think is the number one thing that we need to be aware of in current times? I think things are going from bad to worse, and that is from all aspects. So what I focused on tonight is more keeping you thinking of being physically safe, both in, both in your home and in your uh, public sort of uh, environment. The biggest thing I think is important is have a plan, develop a plan. If you, whether you live by yourself, maybe um, you're empty nesters, it's just you and your spouse. Maybe you um, still have kids in the home, um, especially if you have young children or maybe on the opposite side, maybe you have elderly parents, grandparents, um, maybe you have uh, family members in your household that have disabilities. These special needs sort of people are going to be imperative that your plan includes them. How are we going to handle a home invasion? Um, you know, what is everyone's role? Um, do we have a, a designated safe room? Do we have a plan? Because having a plan in advance is so valuable and um, we'll keep you safe. All right, Judy, we really appreciate it. You gave some awesome information. And again, they can reach out to you at onguarddefense.com. Is that correct? That's right. All right. And then you will be teaching again, you said at Old School Survival Boot Camp, which I think is May the 8th through the 11th. Um, I think this year it's the 12th through the 14th. Um, <laughs> Well, we'll be posting stuff on our, our MAG network as well, because uh, okay. that's a great, great, great list of, oh, of yeah. uh, classes y'all got going on, and it's really grown over the years. So we're actually, yeah. our group's going to be up there this year, so I'm looking forward to, forward to checking it out ourselves. So Awesome. Anyone we look else? forward to seeing you. Yeah. Sherry, Alicia, thumbs up. Any questions? Any last minute? Looks good. All right. Sherry, Thanks, Allie. Good? Thanks, Sherry. All right. Awesome. Uh, I got a few things I'm going to cover real quick, if y'all don't mind, and then we'll call it a night. Um, again, I want to thank Judy from On Guard Defense from Ohio for taking the time out of her evening to go over this with us. I wish we had a few more people. We had more people sign up, but unfortunately, they didn't make it, but we are recording it uh, because we had a lot of people ask for this. So hopefully we can uh, can sweet talk her and maybe add her to her Christmas card list and get her to come back and do something again for us as well. But we've got some more classes coming up on November the 16th. We've got a winemaking class uh, and it's geared toward on a homesteader's budget. You know, don't go out and buy muscadine grapes. You know, use apples, use whatever's on your, on your own homestead. You can make uh, wine and stuff. We was talking at the beginning before we started the class about stuff for bartering and stuff. That would be a good item to have when crap hits the fan to barter with, trade with other people. Uh, and then on December 6th, we have an introduction to aquaponics coming up, which is great. You can, you can grow lots of leafy vegetables, herbs and stuff, you know, all year long in, a, in an enclosed environment. So that's, I'm looking forward to that one myself. And then on the 14th of December, we have Dr. Jen, 
which you'll be hearing talking about what medicines you should stockpile for worst case scenario, uh, going over what, what you need to have, what you don't need to have, but what you need to concentrate on. And just like Judy and I was talking earlier too, I think FEMA says, you know, have at least a week, two weeks, whatever uh, of, you know, supplies on hand. Well, that's all good and well, but looking at, you know, the Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ivan, all these other natural disasters, it's not going to be that quick. There are still parts of, of eastern Kentucky that's still struggling, parts of western Kentucky that's still struggling from the uh, um, tornadoes and stuff. Yes, they'll eventually get there, but if, if it's a truly a crap hit in the fan, you're on your own. So you need to know what you got, what's going on. So those are what we got scheduled right now. Uh, we're looking at trying to have at least two of these a month. Some of the other ones, I've just got to get the date set. We're going to have classes on growing mushrooms, beekeeping basics, introduction to solar power, seasonal foods to bo boost your immune system, and what do you really need in your bug out bag or first aid kit. And uh, those are ones that I've already got commitments to. I just got to get the date set. So if any of y'all have any suggestions or something else y'all like to hear, feel free to message me at any time. I'm Indy Guy on, online. Um, other than that, Judy, thank you. Any questions for us or? Nope, I uh, appreciate the invitation and I hope that's helpful. And I just uh, hope everyone stays safe and God bless the USA. Amen to that. Bless everyone. Y'all have a good night and thank y'all for being here and I hope to see y'all at some of the future classes. Thank you. Bye, good night. everyone. Bye.